everyone. Welcome to Nova Southeastern University's South Florida Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program podcast, also known as the SFGWEP podcast. We are here to educate, encourage, enhance, and promote all those amazing health professions working with the elderly, including patients, caregivers, and support systems. I'm Dr. Shweta Tiwari, Assistant Professor in the Department of Geriatrics, Kiran C. Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine at NOAA Southeastern University. I'm also the Administrative Director of the HRSA-funded South Florida Geriatric Workforce Grant. Just to give a short bio, to welcome a subject matter expert, Dr. Janet Roseman, who will discuss role of spirituality among older adults. Dr. Janet Roseman is an associate professor in integrative medicine at KPCOM. She's also a registered dance therapist and an arts therapist. She's the author of several books, including If Joan of Arc Had Cancer, Finding Courage, Faith, and Healing from History's Most Inspirational Woman Warrior, a book to empower women on the journey with cancer. She received the first Joseph Moore President's Award from Leslie College for her work, as well as a David Larson Fellowship at the Kluge Center for Scholars at the Library of Congress, the second person in the world to hold that honor. She specializes in spirituality and medicine and compassionate care and is the founder and director of the Sydney Project in Spirituality and Medicine and Compassionate Care, a medical education program for residents in honor of a father. So, Dr. Roseman, welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So, to start with, my first question is, can you tell us a little bit about this topic and why is this topic important for you? Hmm. Um, You know, I think spirituality is one of those topics that gets the short shrift, even though there's hundreds and hundreds of research studies to prove how important it is to patients um, and physicians, actually, and other healthcare providers. And I, I think it just isn't taken as seriously as it should. And I'm, I'm always kind of surprised when, especially if I'm working with residents or medical students and they make a comment, I always ask them their feelings about it or and they say, oh, I don't want to discuss spirituality, religion is not important, but it is important. It's important if your patient is fasting for religious or spiritual beliefs and you are uh, giving them medication, you need to know they're not eating. Or if they're a Jehovah's Witness and they don't want a blood product, you have to know that, that's really important. And also, you know, the research studies have shown years of, you know, years and years of research studies have shown that spirituality is important to patients. They have better outcomes, shorter hospital stays, their resilience is much higher, they feel better, they have better support systems, and overall it's a very potent way of of healing. And regardless if you're part of the elderly population or if you're younger, it's just a very important topic. Thank you so much. Yeah, that, that is indeed uh, informative. We also have uh, heard and actually observed that spirituality can mean so many different things to different people. Uh, what are some different methods in which older adults practice spirituality in different cultures? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and I guarantee if you asked you know, five or six of your friends their definition of spirituality, you'll get five or six different answers. And it's the same with the elderly population. For some people, it might be, you know, going to the mosque and praying. It might be going to temple on Friday nights. It might be going to church on Sunday mornings, which is considered more religiosity or a religious Mm -hmm. point of view. For some people, their spirituality can be through organized religion, but usually um, they might define it as baking. You know, it could be baking. They make food for their neighbors, and that's a spiritual experience, or gardening is a spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. It could be yoga or tai chi. It could be sitting with their granddaughter or grandson, and they look at that as a spiritual experience. So it's a very... Even though there's a lot of definitions out there, I kind of shun the definitions because I, <laughs> you know, I really think it's it's what do you choose? You know, what what is sacred to you, and whatever is sacred to you is the right definition. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, I agree with that as well. And as I remember, you spoke about uh, research and spirituality. Uh, there is a lot of support in literature about spirituality, just being a coping mechanism for you know many caregivers who are taking care of older adults. What is your experience in terms of that? In, in terms of the research? Right. There's a lot of research, and I brought some information that I can quickly just go over, which I thought you might be interested in. So the Journal of Family Practice, and I'm just boiling it down to one or two sentences, but Mm -hmm. they found that spirituality forms the base of a meaning and purpose and helps coping. And it's interesting, over 96% of adults in various ages, but especially older adults, use prayer for healing. And it helped them to mitigate stress and offered more resilience which I think is really interesting. And the Mayo Clinic did this comprehensive study of looking at all of the studies on spirituality. Mm -hmm. So looking at over 350 studies on physical health and 850 studies on mental health, they found overall, which is pretty amazing, an older elder population had better health outcomes if they had a spiritual or religious point of view. And they had less hypertension, lower blood pressure, more resilience, they exercised more, they obtained their screenings more. You know, it really has a positive effect. But I'll also say, in terms of caregivers, I know this is kind of long-winded, but... Mm -hmm. Caregivers, and I often speak about this, they, they burn out just as quickly as physicians, only they don't always have the support where a physician might be in practice with someone else, so maybe somebody else could take over for them for a day. But usually caregivers, they don't have that. They don't have a day off, you know, and often it's women and often it's older women who have the burden and responsibility to take care of a family member, and it's extremely stressful. And finding a spiritual way to cope is really, you know, extremely helpful, but also making the time. And I think physicians and other healthcare workers could make a huge difference by just acknowledging caregivers Mm -hmm. and acknowledging their burden and offering some suggestions. And, you know, one thing I always tell medical students and residents is, you know, when you're working with your patient and the caregiver, you know, ask them, what have you done in the past that has supported you during a difficult time? And and they might find, uh, they might share that, you know, their, a spiritual practice was what they found helpful or a religious practice. Okay, so do you do see spirituality being a coping mechanism, especially when caregivers are stressed, taking care of elderly in various situations. Absolutely. It's, um, yeah, it's a profound um, vehicle for taking care of yourself. I think you also answered my next question when we talked about research in terms of practice of spirituality and prayer, you know, kind of helping in health outcomes or any chronic disease management. You did cite about the hypertension study Mm -hmm. and a couple of other studies, how it can really help in managing health outcomes. Yeah, I mean, it. Um, studies have shown that patients who had a spiritual or religious practice, um, they had lower blood pressure, they had less hospitalizations, they saw their doctor more frequently. If they smoked, they quit. You know, they just had better, they looked at their overall health in a more holistic manner, you know, mind, body, and spirit. They had mm-hmm. less depression. They had a better quality of life because they also had community support. It's pretty important. And they were more positive about their life overall, no matter what their age was. Right, right. Thank you so much. My next question Mm -hmm. is uh, more towards your observations or your experiences in terms of working with people. Like, How did you see that, what they perceived as barriers to spirituality? Oh, that's a good question. So, so not physicians, you're talking about patients? In general, people, yeah. What are some of the barriers? I would say if someone's gone through a very difficult time and who hasn't, right? Mm-hmm. As we get older, we've all experienced something difficult. It's very easy to kind of lose your faith. So if you're 
often people who are extremely religious or even spiritual lose their faith if they've lost a child or something really horrible has happened in their life. It's difficult for them to really resurrect those feelings of faith, which are totally understandable and not something that a physician should ignore and say, oh, you know, give it another try or, you know, to really listen to the patient's story about that and let them find their way. And you could say something if you were a physician as simple as, you know, I totally understand what you're, or I'm trying to understand what you're telling me. And I'm just wondering if maybe there's a way to find that faith again, since you found it so helpful. So you could say, you know, some of my patients have told me that when they walk every night with a friend, that they really feel supported and they feel loved. And that can be a spiritual experience. And you can ask them, you know, so what is your opinion? What do you think? Is there something you can think of that might help you? And always I think it's doctors too often and healthcare providers mistakenly have the attitude that they have all the answers and they don't. And really hearing what your patient has to say and validating it is is really important. Let them inform you. You know, let them tell you. Maybe they have an art practice Mm -hmm. that they gave up a long time ago and maybe you can encourage them or you know, some of my patients have kept a diary and found that helpful. And I'm I'm wondering if you had five or ten minutes in the morning to write things down. And I would really, you know, next time we meet, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Or I understand you used to paint. Is that something you're interested in doing again? Or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. You know, having an arts-based practice is very healing. And also for patients, well, anybody. Not everybody's verbal. So it's a great way to express what you're feeling. So I I just, you know, I just always encourage people to, you have to meet them where they are. True, true, very true. Uh, Coming back uh, from a provider's perspective, uh, you know, since the patient-physician relationship is so integral in many aspects of age-friendly healthcare as well, Mm -hmm. and uh, one of the components of age-friendly healthcare is what matters most, uh, which is where the provider is kind of addressing with the patient in terms of what's really important for you. And sometimes spiritual beliefs could be the most important thing for them. So what do you think or when do you think a provider should be addressing the spiritual beliefs, especially when there's an end-of-life care experience, you know, issue with the patient? Well, definitely at an end of life, but I find, and the research supports this, which is interesting, most physicians and healthcare providers don't even introduce the conversation until it's end of life. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, okay, I mean, I'm being brusque, but, um, oh, the patient is at end of life, so maybe we should talk about their spiritual or religious beliefs. And why don't I call in a chaplain or a rabbi or something? That's very dismissive. And the truth is, as I said, Everything that I said about older adults having better outcomes and better mental health and more positivity and better resilience and, you know, lower blood pressure, less heart disease, etc., that's applicable to anybody at any age. So, yes, it's important to talk about that and let the patient tell you, but it's important really for patients of any age, you know, and introducing something as simple as, do you have any spiritual or religious beliefs that might affect my care? You know, is there anything you'd like to discuss? It's not a topic that should be reserved for end of life, and it should not a topic that should be pawned off mm-hmm. to someone else. And as a physician or healthcare provider, you need to be in touch with your own beliefs. So you don't walk in the room with your own beliefs, because it's not about sharing your religious or spiritual beliefs with your patient. So it doesn't really matter if you're an atheist or you're incredibly, you know, a born-again Christian. It doesn't really matter because that's not something that should be discussed in the room. And often physicians think, oh, I don't want to talk about it, then I'll have to talk about my spirituality. Well, no. And 
even if the patient asks you, you can say, well, you know, I, I do have particular beliefs, but I'm more interested in yours. And, you know, prayer is another topic. Some patients want their physicians to pray with them. And that's great. But it's only great if the physician is comfortable. You know, if you're comfortable doing that, fabulous. If you're not comfortable, then you can say, I'm going to think positive thoughts for you. And I'm just wondering, maybe there's someone in your family that you could pray with. Or, you know, it's important to be honest. That's how you change the culture for patients and for physicians, just to be authentic. Oh, one question, Dr. Roseman, that always crosses my mind, and I'm sure providers also go through it. It might be confusing for them also. We do have a patient population who might not believe in religion or spirituality. Mm -hmm. So how does a provider address that? Because, I mean, listening to you, spirituality is an important component, which should be discussed in conversations. But what if a patient is, is resistant or, you know, just doesn't want to talk about it? Well, I think respecting that. And the other thing, sometimes it's just verbiage, right? Sometimes spirituality means something different or religion means something different. And you could always ask them, you know, well, what does that mean to you? Why do you think it's not important? I'm just curious. I'd like to learn more. That might be a way in. And another way in might just be... You know, I'm just wondering what you do to nurture yourself. As I said earlier, you know, what helps you? What brings you joy in your life? And sometimes just taking a walk and breathing really deeply to have more energy or just to relax if somebody is really anxious. Or you could even introduce it if they don't have the tools. You know, some of my patients have found that deep breathing is really a wonderful exercise when you're feeling scared. And I know you're going through a really difficult time. And I'm wondering, would you like me to show you a short minute exercise you could do that would help you relax and feel comfortable? So you don't even have to use spirituality or that, religion. Yeah, that's you know. what I was thinking. Yeah, you don't use the terms, but you kind of explore those things so that the individual addresses it in some way or the other. Absolutely. That's a beautiful way to to do it and you don't have to get involved because you don't you don't want to be combative or outsmart your patient on how much you know that's not important anything else dr roseman that you would like listeners to know about uh, spirituality <laughs> <laughs> i know we talked a lot about but yeah. i really want you to it's it it's is. what would i say i guess i encourage people to find something that's meaningful in their life and like I said, it could be going to a particular religion, attending church or a mosque or particular religious rituals, which is lovely. But it could be something, like I said, you know, sitting with your grandchildren. It could be baking or walking or dancing. Or I think it's important in anybody's quality of life, if we're talking about mind, body, spirit, which is the whole package, right? You know, finding something that is meaningful to you and understanding that might change over time. So it's okay. You know, maybe you went to church on a regular basis and that meant a lot when you were in your 20s and 30s, but now you're finding that it doesn't have as much purpose or maybe it has more purpose. You know, I don't know what that is, but, you know, not judging it, just being flexible mm -hmm. and you know, go with, find something. Uh, I mean, that I think is important. You need to find something that is nourishing. Thank you, Dr. Roseman. Thank you so much for such insightful conversation. Thank you for joining us today. Please stay tuned for the upcoming topics from our renowned subject matter experts. Thank you once again. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed it.